Call the meeting to order at 6.05. Ms. Dryden? Present. Mr. Sullivan? Present. Uh, Trustee Kennedy, you can be a little late. Trustee Hop? Here. Dr. John Edis? Present. I'll second.
We reconvene at 6.5. No action was taken. Session. And at this time, we're going to go ahead and give the Pledge of Allegiance. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? I move to approve the minutes as presented or amended. I'll second the motion. Any discussion? Yeah. Any discussion? Uh, I have a few comments. On the J January 14th, um, the first item, it has the roll count for absent and um, the eyes may absent, but they're all eyes. So it should be four eyes and one absent. Did we also broadcast the 14th on Zoom? Then we should remove that as well. And then on the 17th, it's the same thing for the first vote for the adopting the agenda. It does have one absent um, in the narrative, but the the eyes and um, absent need to be changed to four one. And then there's also some highlights to go ahead. Anything further? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries four zero. Do we have an audience to address the board? Now moving on to the superintendent's report. All right, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, there are some folks uh, who are joining us uh, remotely as well. So I want to express my appreciation for them um, and my deep appreciation for this, for this room full of uh, important people. So I'm gonna jump uh, out of order here in the superintendent's report. And um, I wish to start with some celebrations. And before I get to mock trial, because I know that that's where a lot of energy and interest happens to be, I really want to uh, celebrate uh, three people in particular. Uh, quiero celebrar tres personas en particular. Um, and uh, we have some, some mementos here as part of our Mesa Moments recognition. Um, I wanted to recognize our cafeteria staff. Um, and, and there's several reasons why. Uh, not only do they do fantastic work, but for the last six months, uh, they have been a lot of people were put out during our construction period, but they were put out probably more than most. Worked flexibly, worked diligently, worked collaboratively. Uh, le quiero extender las, la, las gracias a, a nuestro personal de la cafetería que trabajó increíblemente uh, colaborativamente uh, con un tremendo, una tremenda cantidad de flexibilidad. Uh, se les agradece porque por los últimos seis meses, durante la construcción, el periodo de construcción, um, se mantuvieron flexibles, colaborativas, y tremendamente en apoyo a todo lo que se hace aquí en la escuela. So with that said, I want to uh, have them come up, please. Um, all, all three, all three, there's, there's, let's have all three. So we have, we have Miss Debbie Sussman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Paula, Paula, Louise. Uh, 
Thank you so much for, for everything. And I just wanted to uh, express our gratitude, my gratitude for just the, the fact that you worked so diligently from throughout the summer, all the way down to this uh, January and early December, December uh, the entire month was still very difficult for us. But thank you for your um, hard work and dedication. Thank you. Thank you. So as we're doing the photo ops, we'll continue. Um, next, I wanted to really recognize uh, an incredible group of young people, incredible representation. You know, a year ago, more, more than a year ago, uh, Mrs. Romero came, came to me uh, last year, last school year, with the idea of starting mock trial. And it was a great, tremendous opportunity to move into the middle school. We knew that it would be a great opportunity for our kids to uh, come together and do something to showcase their talents, to build up their talents. Uh, here we are now two cycles later, and it has gotten exponentially better, exponentially bigger, and we couldn't be more proud of them. So, but before I get to the kids, I really want to celebrate the adults first and foremost, because uh, this does not come together easily, and it is not something that comes without a tremendous amount of leadership, sacrifice, and commitment. So I do have some some recognitions here for our mock trial coaches, and there are three of them. So let me start with our, our one of our judges, Judge George Romero, if you could come up. So next, I wanted to uh, celebrate Mrs. Christina Vanarelli. Here, and she's last year. She was going to come back, and I think she's coming in right now. No, not quite, but she'll be, she'll be here soon. She'll be here soon, and we'll be here to celebrate her. Um, and of course, uh, our own trustee, our, our board president, Mrs. Uh, Sandra Long. So when Mrs. Vanarelli comes in, we can make sure to honor her. And and of course, while we're all here as well, um, our kids, our 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 mock trial. Let's give our again a big round of applause. I want to, I want, and if, and not, I understand not everybody is present, but I wanted to make sure I, I called everybody out uh, by name. Um, and so in no particular order, okay? Um, Nadia uh, Prieto. Okay, perfect. And uh, Kyla Sahagan. Isa Ronquillo. And if you want to come forward, Amy Carroll, Haley Roberson, uh, let's see, uh, May Lynn from Keo, Clarissa Lada, Paizo Okamura, Arpan Shrestha. Inez Robles, Matt Lopez, Sebastian Rodini, Dorian Ford, Leva Lara, Christian Lopez, come on over, Daniel Chen. Connor Candy, uh, Sophia Turner, and we also we also have five, uh, five, uh, fifth grade understudies or understudies. Uh, Jennifer Stalker, Poppy Green, 
Jonathan Marquez, Steven Romero, and Jonathan Vega. So I, I just want to tell you and inform your parents, family members, and community uh, just how immensely proud I am, and we all are, uh, your commitment to this program, sometimes even when you didn't want to, was significant. And um, and I, I also want to turn it over to Mrs. Romero, who can actually say far more than I can about their accomplishments. And I'll actually turn it over to her to be able to share with all of you what their accomplishments and commitment entail. Well, I, I am super proud of all of our Mod College kids. And, you know, there was a, there was a huge difference from last year and this year. And our program has gotten so much better. And it's going to get even better next year. It'll be better than this year. And we've talked about what we're going to do to make it better because we want you guys to continue to grow and to learn and to be successful. And one of the reasons why I love competitions is because it really pushes them to prepare and to prepare and to get better. And competitions really bring the best out of students. And so, you know, I hope that many of them can come back next year and we'll make it better. And, you know, we've had a great year. We had second and third place. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of learning learning in mock trial, everything from critical thinking, public speaking, to your in expressing your vocal voice and incorporating your body language. And there's just so many, so many great um, aspects that mock trial teaches. Like my husband has said in the past, mock trial is probably the best extracurricular program that we are aware of. And so I hope that the kids get a you know, I know that they got a lot out of it and they practice the skills that they've learned. And, you know, we're, we're very proud of all of you. And I, I, perhaps Gilbert has something more to say. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what I love and the reason why I participate in mock trial is because you want to see the students from day one and see them grow and see them progress, see them work and build that team and see them learn the material and strive to get better. And we got the opportunity over the last couple of years, you know, to see a couple of students do the program two years. You know, I, I know Inez, she's gonna be graduating going on to high school. Sophia, she's not here. But to get to see, I, I remember Sophia coming last year. She was so shy and she was Inez too. Inez too. <laughs> Shy and just you know, not not really knowing what the competition is all about. And to see you, and to see Sophia, and to see the other students, Ava, who's been here for two years, and a lot of kids, uh, May Lynn, who just did outstanding the last couple of years. To see you two grow, to see all of you grow over the last few years, that that's rewarding to me. I'm sure it's rewarding for Sandra and Christina. So I want to thank you because I think I learned just as much from all of you as I hope. You guys did some work, so thank you. Thank you. One, one final thing that I'll say, and I and I learned this a little bit through uh, my interactions with some of the parents, some of the kids as well shared this, but um, in in something that makes makes it unique is that people, young people here, grow up together, and the fact that this group, you know, I think they established their own chat or thread or whatever it is. But the point is you guys are communicating. And that's so important because those are friendships and relationships that will last you long beyond your time. And for me, that's incredibly gratifying to see you uh, come together um, just as people, as, as people with goals and ambitions and dreams of your own. Um, so I couldn't be more proud of you. We couldn't be more proud of you. And I hope that you um, take this opportunity as us celebrating you, your hard work, your dedication, and your accomplishments. And a couple other things. You know, the Ventura County Office of Education awarded you second and third place, many individual awards. Those are pending. We are still waiting for them to come. We are going to get them. I'm not too sure when, but they're coming, and you guys will get that physical class award. And also, we have the here. <laughs> Thank you.
Uh, um, let me let me go ahead and so this Christina, this is on on behalf of Mason. I wanted to take all the I'm not going to hear from you. Okay, so I'm going to take this off. Okay, so I'm going to take this off. Party on Friday at Crawford. You know, send an email. Everybody's invited. Pizza's on us. So the, the rap party continues. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, yeah, so let's go ahead and take a, a picture and let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, all level up as much as we can. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So a lot of a lot of celebration. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, just reacclimate. Um, so I just wanted to make mention of one other one other uh, event, and there are many others, but I wanted to make mention of one event. So obviously the the uh, celebration and, and acknowledgement of the accomplishments of our mock trial teams, uh, we call them one team, but it's really two, um, is is pretty tremendous. And I'm glad that the board had an opportunity to meet them, to celebrate them as well. Um, uh, just wanted to point out, uh, during my superintendent uh, presentations, I try to just single out maybe a few important events that have transpired since we last met. Another really important one 
our middle school trip to Cal Poly Slope, build an engineer day. We had a tremendous, tremendous turnout. Um, that was on a Saturday. Uh, people had to get here really early, stayed out really late. Mrs. Dryden knows know this all too well. It, was, it became a real family affair for her as well. Uh, but anyhow, I wanted to really just showcase the fact that we are at Mesa trying to continue to uh, venture out, get kids to see some things that are that are uh, important for them, not, not only here and now, but in their future. Um, our Build an Engineer Day was a great opportunity for them to um, come together um, and to also to have an opportunity to set foot on a college campus, hear from uh, students, and for the most part students, but also professors that um, are in the field and or trying to pursue um, a career in engineering. And it was really great to see them explore. So many thanks uh, to Mrs. Spillane, uh, Mrs. Roberson, uh, Mr. Di Maria, Mr. Puga, who drove there and back, and to all of our parents, chaperones, and parents in general who um, supported us in, in making sure that their kids were available and took part in this opportunity. Uh, moving on. Uh, just continuing to, to, and we'll talk more about this, but you know, obviously, um, we, we continue to um, pay close attention to things as they surface relative to COVID. We still have uh, testing kits. We still are making that a regular practice to give out to families. Um, and we'll continue to have those available uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, so as, um, you know, breaks, whether it's uh, whatever it is, uh, right now it's definitely a season um, for us. And I'll talk more about that a little bit later. I uh, wanted to give some facilities updates, uh, and that is, I mean, the biggest uh, news is that our window uh, replacement project will be coming to a, an official end and close very, very soon. We're kind of in the last percentages, if you will. Our punch list uh, was scheduled uh, scheduled for completion this month, been in regular and close contact with Mr. De Leon, uh, who is director of uh, facilities for BSA. And uh, the kitchen, you know, as you heard me mention, was one of our most impacted spaces. Um, and there were some things there that were existing that needed to be addressed and um, some tremendous upgrades that we wanted to capitalize on. And so what we know now is that that is being done right. It's been done right. And um, we, we will enjoy that space, uh, you know, as, a, as, a, as an added feature to Mesa for, for many, many years to come. Um, with the close of one project, of course, we're already thinking ahead to the future. And uh, although we won't delve into this this evening, I did want to um, highlight some conversations that I know we've had as a board uh, or that you've had as a board with me about what's next or what could be next. And there will be some further discussion here in the in the month ahead as we bring more information to the board to make decisions upon. But just a high level view, there's approximately $3.58 million remaining, and that's a very, very um, uh, general figure. Obviously, there's more expenses here uh, to come. Uh, an additional 600,000, again, a ballpark figure uh, in the Deferred Maintenance Fund, again, in, intended to extend the life of our, of our bond and its impact. Uh, we also submitted uh, an application for 1.9 million, and the, the board received some notification via the memo on this, but the, this is for a reimbursement from the state of California. The initial application was done in conjunction with SchoolWorks back in 2019 uh, with um, former superintendent. Um, and that, that, is, that is now, I mean, it just goes to show that, you know, uh, from Mr. Turner's time to now, uh, thinking ahead and, and wondering if, you know, where things would lead, and our application effectively came due, and now it's being you know kind of reviewed. So we're going to be putting in, uh, we put in the finishing touches on that uh, in conjunction with SchoolWorks and 196, our architects on this project to look for a reimbursement, um, and we tentatively are projecting 1.9, 1.8 to 1.9 million in eligible reimbursement for Mesa. Like I said, we will have more information on this to come. The expected timeline is about three years. Um, so it's not coming soon, but it is important to know that it's out there and that we already set the wheels in motion to collect that reimbursement. Um, but all that brings us to what the next phase of construction will, will look like for the district. Um, 
as we talk about expensing the last remaining funds. We know we've got needs. Uh, the well project is one that we definitely will need to tend to. Uh, but there are a few priorities that have been discussed, an early childhood center, uh, middle school improvements, and then, of course, where we stand with green or renewable energy. So um, I don't mean to delve on this for now, but just rather to put it as a placeholder for some future conversations as early as next month. <clears throat> next slide, please. Uh, switching gears, uh, our attendance figures, um, they're here. And if we could see just the figures um, as a table, <clears throat> um, I every month I've been reporting out to the board, you know, since I became superintendent. And every month, you know, we've been talking um, through some very challenging uh, conditions. Uh, when it comes to attendance, we continue to experience some challenging conditions. And if you don't mind, maybe going to the next slide. So we're trying to establish this uh, balancing act between the need to continue to tend to uh, students or family members that happen to come ill um, with the reality that being in uh, present and in classrooms learning is, as we've discovered, one of the most effective ways to ensure that students are continuing to grow and develop uh, personally and, and uh, academically. So uh, this is just a very, very snapshot view. I, I want to thank um, our front office, uh, Jelana, Leticia, uh, Ms. Ms. Klinsky, um, Ms. Torres, uh, all of these folks who just really pitched in and our teachers who continue to make this a priority. Uh, this is a high level view. We'll see it later in the mid-year LCAP report, but 145 students have nine or more total absences. And that's a combination of excused and excused or where there was no reason cited. The no reason is a very minimal uh, percentage, but that is um, the, the nine is 10% or more, effectively creates a 10% or more absence rate. Um, the, the, um, the school attendance review team, 32 meetings were scheduled uh, during the months of January and into February uh, with those that have either the most acute, well, those that have the most acute attendance um, uh, needs um, since the start of the year. And um, those are challenging conversations. They're very informative, but they're challenging because uh, we have to really talk about some root causes when it comes to why attendance isn't the way isn't isn't where it may need to be. So they've been fruitful, but they've been very labor intensive, and very uh, a lot of attention has been paid to this. Um, our question now is how do we make this a sustainable practice? And it will require a lot of effort on our part, but it is a worthwhile um, uh, important topic. Um, as a result of those conversations that we had, um, all families were uh, received. Um, mid-year attendance reports, along with an informational letter explaining how attendance works and, and what attendance looks like and why it's important in the first place. So we, we know that we have to just engage in an informational campaign as well over time. So we've, we've started to do that. And uh, there will be more reporting now. We have seen anecdotally that, it, that attendance has improved, but of course, we're still early on and we're still battling those very conditions that we've talked about so often. Um, I want to just conclude with some upcoming events. Um, uh, some of these actually took place, one of these took place today. Uh, middle School Showcase, great opportunity for our uh, rising fifth going into sixth grade students to hear more about our middle school program, what we're planning, uh, who we are, and what we have in place for them, their families, help them in a transitional period to be able to move forward and, and really um, better understand what that transition entails for their kids in spite of, of course, being in a TKA. Um, we've got our TKK Tiger Cub Family Night. That'll be coming up on Thursday. Our Mesa Challenge on Friday, May 10th. Spring Break, the 27th through the 7th. And we are now fully in that in that uh, last part of the year where we're seeing the, the finality of the year come upon us. It's hard to say, but hard to believe, but um, we, we are at that point. Uh, we'll be returning from Spring Break on April 10th. And... Um, Throughout the month of May, we'll be having our annual CASP assessments now. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and conclude the superintendent's report. I was just gonna have a comment. I thought that it was um, the attendance report 
it was nice. It was just a two, two pager and it very clearly spelled out, you know, all of the school days that have occurred thus far. And it was very clear where your student may or you know, may have been absent and whether it was an excused absence or not. But what was so helpful is also then have a second page that let you know the definition of what is an excused absence, what is not an excused absence and what that means. And it definitely highlighted that the, why we want everybody to come to school is the learning loss. We really wanna try to make sure everybody stays on target because we want them not to get behind. It also, I think was helpful for me as somebody who's looking and saying, well, what does it mean procedurally? You know, what does it mean when it's excused versus unexcused? And I think a lot of parents had thought, well, as long as it was for a doctor's note, you know, it's okay, the school still gets funding. Um, but that's not how it works. And so I, I thought it was very helpful to have it all spelled out. So um, thank you for all the, those that prepared it. What I also like is that the school sends a tardy text message when your son or daughter are tardy to class and that pushes parents to leave earlier or do something to make arrangements to not be late because it is a disruption for a student to walk into class late. Um, so that's that's good, I think, too. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on this. Um, obviously, we're trying to approach this from a variety of different uh, avenues. Uh, we wanted to make it simple and clear. Um, and so there was uh, an important uh, part of that being concise. Um, and the other thing is we're trying to use our, you know, the, the tools that we already have at our disposal uh, to be able to alert parents. It's it's in part a safety issue. It's in great part a uh, an attendance, I'm sorry, a learning issue, um, but it's really about the kind of standard and environment that we want to foster. And, um, you know, the impact to one student um, is, is significant enough, but the disruption to your point, Mrs. Romero, is, is sometimes felt across the board if there's a delay in a class or whatever the case might be. So I, I just, um, you know, I applaud our, our staff for their hard work and, and diligence. I also know that it's been a good, um, uh, opportunity for us. And, and that uh, report really came out of those conversations with parents where we were hearing some common trends emerge. And there was a feeling that uh, we needed to revisit that with our parents. So that'll be something that we'll find ways of revisiting on a more regular basis. Um, but we wanted to just move ahead now uh, without delaying further. Who sends out the text messages? Is it the district or the front office? That we're one in the same, but okay. I'm trying to understand the question. So the text messages that parents get? The, the text messages that parents get are coming via Parent Square, which is a, a tool that we use and many school districts in this county use uh, to be able to communicate with parents. But uh, we have uh, created uh, ways of um, pulling from the attendance report and being able to notify parents on a daily basis. So it's automated. It doesn't go out as a regular alert. It's something that is just automated uh, to be an ongoing um, an ongoing action whenever uh, there's a school day. Hope that answers your question. I have a question about the attendance. Um, uh, I appreciate the fact that we're reaching out to these kids. I like what Ms. Dryden says is that what the persons harm the most are the students when they miss a day. Um, but I also looked at the numbers there, and I know it's 25% of them have missed nine days or more. 25% of our student body. What have we, as an administration and a governing body, learned about why these kids are missing? And is there anything that we can do proactively to help them and support them? And I, I realize that sometimes, you know, like party messages, some of these things are out of control of the students. Um, it's whatever their parents desire. Um, if they don't show up on time or if they don't come, um, you know, oh, you got a doctor's appointment today, you'll just stay home all day today type of thing. But what have we learned to help so that we can make proactive choices in educating uh, students and parents? So it really runs the gamut, but um, as I mentioned before, one of the things that came up as a very big um, trend or through those conversations was uh, something that Mrs. Uh, Dryden just mentioned, which is the belief that if there's appointments or doctor related or whatever the case might be, that those are 
automatically excused and that is in effect um it's the word um there's not really a harm to that right um as we know um the loss of time is harmful enough um and then within that there are legitimate um illnesses there are kids with flu with cold with covid um so those those have also surfaced as a very uh, clear message from parents that uh, they would be here if they could uh, but we're sending a mixed message to be very honest with you we're on the one hand expressing be thoughtful be be proactive yourself and not bringing your children to school um, uh, while they're ill, but at the same time trying to um, promote uh, attendance. Uh, I'll, have to, I'll have to tell you, it's a very difficult balancing act to strike uh, for, for that reason, because we're hearing from parents that in many instances, these are legitimately uh, illnesses, right? They just happen to tally nine or more. Um, and if there's a COVID event, uh, that's probably going to be five days right there. I mean, almost at a minimum. So there's um, there's a lot in between that. And for us, it's about hearing from families. It's about being as accommodating as possible, flexible as possible, but trying to reorient toward a standard where our expectation is that students will be here on a given basis. So um, uh, you can hear just in my commentary, it's very, very challenging to be able to find that soft spot in the middle. Thank you. Anything further? All right. So moving on, uh, board members, reports and communications. Does anybody have any correspondence to share? Nope. All right. Is there a motion to wait? On this? And then board members, reports and communications right, so, yeah. and yeah. board members, interests and concerns. Right. So. Anything further? Well, that is still an open question. Not quite sure yet. Anything further? Yes, I have a an item here, and that has to. I appreciate uh, what Dr. Ramirez did today tonight about recognizing the mock trial. Thank you, um, Ms. Romero, for helping with the mock trial and the team that was there. Um, one of the things, though, that I think in the last few Mesa moments is that we've not had this is an opportunity that the board has to acknowledge 
and to give praise and uh, those that are receiving these awards. The most important thing, I, I look at what happened tonight. Um, one of our students from the mock trial had such poise in just standing right up and leading the Pledge, Pledge of Allegiance uh, so well with no fear, with no trepidation. She just, boom, done. It's Here's how you do it. And, and I appreciate that. And so I just, in these future events, I, I just want us to be able as a board to come out front and shake their hands and acknowledge those, the, the kitchen staff. You know, I've got 20 years of experience, over 20 years of experience with uh, Mrs. Sussex and how she's worked in the kitchen. And I appreciate what they do. And this is an opportunity that we as a board need to get out there and be able to shake hands and to honor them. It's not about us. It's about us giving honor to the recipients. You know, move, just to take that a little bit further, I was thinking perhaps at some, at some future, we could have like an, a plaque, a mock trial plaque with the students that have been um, maybe receiving top individual awards, just having their names, uh, you know, starting from last year to, to the present. Uh, something small and not very big, just to acknowledge their their commitment and their hard work and and their recognition. Anything further? No, oh, there, there was one other thing. You know, uh, Trustee Dryden had talked about putting in an ad for the CAO, and. Uh, these are the types of things that we should, we as a board, in my opinion, should be supporting and acknowledging and let our students know that that's what's important. Um, in conjunction with what I just said, uh, years and years ago, um, I, I was reading through the minutes of uh, the Oxnard Union High School District. And the members of the board of trustees would, every meeting would say, I went to a football game, I went to a basketball game, I went to a volleyball game. And the athletes were brought in from time to time. Uh, but never, never were the scholars um, of this student body brought in and acknowledged uh, for their efforts. And so that's something that I want to be able to encourage uh, those types of events. And that's why I want to bring honor to that is that this is a behavior I want to encourage. I want the mock trial to go forward. We used to be very much involved in uh, the first Lego League. You know, one of our trustee members took that on and drove that. And uh, those are behaviors we want to encourage and want to acknowledge and invite our students and let them know that we are pleased with what they're doing. What they're doing is good and, and they need to have that affirmation. Thank you. And, and I agree, you know, competitions, I think, like I said earlier, are very important. And I, I really do think that competitions encourage and um, allow kids to just perfect themselves and be better and practice and, and learn, you know, they, because they are going to compete. So they need to be able to uh, be competitive. And so that, you know, I mean, these kids spend so many hours just working on whether it was their opening statement, their uh, direct cross-examination of witnesses, closing arguments and just understanding the whole process, objections. There's a lot, a lot of material. And in addition to all of that, there's there's a whole aspect of presentation and body language and projecting their voice. There's just so many different areas that it touches. I mean, I think it touches all of these areas in the framework that Dr. Ramirez has put together and more because you put it all in a competition setting. Uh, right? You know, talking about competitions, we also have Battle of the Books. That is April 27th. Uh, we do have a team. It's, uh, the Battle of the Books is only for kids in third through fifth grade. Uh, the teams can have between three and five kids. Uh, there are 28 books that need to be read by every single one of the team members. And so far, um, the kids have been reading about, uh, there are about 20 books into the, the whole collection, which is great. We're going to have our first practice on Thursday here in the NPR. 
And it's going to be the first time the Ventura County Office of Education sponsors the Battle of the Books. We don't know what it's going to be like, but we know that it's a trivia type of style. Uh, so we're going, to tr we're going to practice for that. And it's something that I'm looking forward to. These books are, you know, they cover such a different variety of, of areas, everything from orphans to uh, history to, um, gosh, what else? I mean, it's, it's just, they're all award-winning books. They, these are books that, that hook kids into reading and they don't stop reading. It's, it's just great um, to see these kids uh, diving into these books. And I'm really happy to, to know that they're all into the books. And a lot of the understudies are part of the Battle of the Books, which is great to see. Anything further? All right. Um, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move that we approve the consent agenda as presented or amended. Is there a second? Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Right. Motion carries 5 0. And no opposition. All right, uh, moving on to the mid-year LCAP. Okay, so thank you again, uh, Board President Trustee Romero. Um, we have, um, this is going to start kicking off our um, LCAP season. And um, last year, a year ago, we wound up with, a, um, with an LCAP mid-year report that was mandated. Um, it, was, it was part of the, part of a, a statute that um, required that. Um, but I felt that it was a, a good practice for us to just continue to engage in. So uh, what I wanted to do is, you know, there's so much to the LCAP, so much work and effort that goes into it. And I just wanted to preface this presentation by saying a couple of things. One, that um, no single point of data or information will encapsulate or capture all that a student is all that a classroom is, all of that a teacher does, or that a school does. I mean, today was just an, an example of just how dynamic things are. We try in our in, in public, public schools to try to quantify certain things, just to make sure that we are receiving information in real time. But, um, you know, so much of what we do is, is really about putting our best foot forward. And so many of the actions that we've undertaken of late are, actions or programs that are relatively new. So I just wanted to, to couch my, my presentation within that spirit and that commentary. Last point, um, while things in society and in the community are normalizing, in other words, they look similar to the way that they did pre-pandemic. Uh, I'm afraid to say that the impact on kids is still something that those of us who work around them on a regular basis still know to be true two to three years of a young person's life is, um, it's not an insignificant amount of time and the context under which they're learning continues to, to this day. So um, I'll talk more about that a little later, but I just wanted to preface this presentation with that. And to a happy moment, the, this picture was taken by our very own trustee Dryden. And I wanted to put it up here Number one, because I look fantastic in it. That's let's just start there. But beyond that, it was just a moment over at Cal Poly Slow, uh, where the kids and and we all just gathered right before we left, right before we boarded the bus. Uh, it was such a good time, you know. Kids really just being themselves, silly, goofy, aspirational, inquisitive, the whole nine, just the full gamut. And uh, Mrs. Mrs. Dryden did right. I'm not. I'm not a. I'm not into these moments. I'm into them in the moment, but I'm not the one to call them out. And so Mrs. Dryden made it a point to say, aren't we going to take a picture before we leave? To which I said, absolutely, we will. And this is one of those. And I just thought that it was just a, a happy moment that I wanted to share that I think um, takes us beyond numbers or programs or any one thing to just uh, what Mesa does, build community, come together and really uh, prepare kids for uh, oftentimes uh, a world that hasn't been created yet. Um, so with that said, we're going to jump in. 
Um, I want to just take the first slide or two to refresh our memory on what our goals of the LCAP happen to be. Just a reminder for ourselves and for the community, we have four goals. Those priorities listed there, there's a total of nine priorities that the state has put out, giving us flexibility to be able to focus our attention on how we want to delve into them. So the priorities are numbered one through nine. Nine isn't there because it is effectively a county office function. Uh, but our four goals are there. Ensure high academic achievement through rigorous student-centered learning experiences for all students. Maintain a collaborative culture of meaningful partnerships as opposed to student learning. Create a welcoming and safe learning environment that is responsive to the social emotional development of all students and increases connectedness among students and families. And lastly, foster a culture of professional growth and learning that is centered on student needs. Um, next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> We are still working through what data sets to bring. Uh, certain data sets are better left to certain audiences. For example, there are certain uh, pieces of, of data that teachers need, that teachers need to be able to make decisions um, about their learning, about their teaching, about students' learning. And um, so I just wanted to say that, that this data set is very limited in that regard, but it is important for the board to be to have a bird's eye view of, of where our program happens to be and where our students are performing at this particular time. The other thing is that the LCAP really stresses the importance of taking care of our vulnerable students, our vulnerable audiences, our students that are identified as low income, our emerging multilingual, multilingual uh, also known as English learner. Uh, I, I put that term out there, emergent multilingual, because English learner sounds def, um, deficit oriented. But if you tell a kid that they are becoming bilingual, there's a different feel to that, right? Um, and then our students who happen to be um, identified as foster or, or homeless and our students with special needs. Those are all audiences and our students that uh, we want to center on. So I wanted to just reiterate some of the high level actions that were taking place. This delves back to our last uh, LCAP, of course. Um, and it's not an exhaustive list, but it's a high level view. Within goal one, we wanted to really focus on the expansion of early childhood education and learning support. Learning acceleration is becoming really a, a, a big thing for us as we talk about how we build our program back. And um, that included a very key role, which is our learning support specialist role, which has a hybrid role of tending to students, but also working with the adults to have coherence and consistency within our programs. Next was expansion of after-school programming and of course, instructional materials and therein, uh, namely, or with this particular focus to the adoption of new science curriculum. Uh, goal two, maintaining a collaborative culture. We wanted to expand our co-curricular and experiential learning, things like field trips, exposure to college and higher ed. Um, goal three, you see there that we increased um, the number of hours of a uh, trained uh, so, uh, socio-emotional, socio sorry, support service provider, SES. And uh, we increased our psychologist time to 80%, went uh, with our county partners on that. And we moved forward with implementation of a new curriculum within our uh, K-8. Goal four, you see there, um, we're really focusing on making our instruction more student-centered, our learning experiences more dynamic and more, um, more intersectionality between content areas. Now that's a long, long, long vision, but more, more than anything else, what we wanna do is make sure that our, the way we teach and the way we tend to students in the classroom reaches them where they are. That if they need acceleration because they are at or above grade standards, that we're able to do that, but that if students aren't near grade standards yet, that we're able to pull them in and support them. So we'll talk more about that in a moment. <clears throat> So um, I wanted to share just some data sets here. Um, uh, just when we talk about metrics, there are some that have outcomes that are unknown, some that are in progress, and some that are known. So we're gonna talk a little bit about um, a, a particular high level view of our major trends of where we are. Next slide, please. So this has a lot of information packed into one slide. Um, let, it's broken up into academic and behavioral. It's a way of, I guess, um, viewing things according to, you know, a, a, um, a design. 
And we actually shared this with our staff and unpacked this over the last two months, in fact, to January and February. So uh, I'll start with the academic. Um, you see there that our grade level span have specific areas of focus. Uh, literacy, student goal setting. We want to increase student agency. We want to increase student performance. And that's a common through line. We're focusing on personalizing our curriculum and our learning across. But every grade level has a very different focus depending on what their data or what they're, what they're seeing from kids. Four, five has a math orientation, again, student goal setting. And six, eight, writing and math along with the student goal setting. Now, bear in mind, six through eight has departments. So you have teachers that have specializations in, in specific areas. Learning support, um, these are just at a glance. 97 total students receiving reading support, of which 81 are via pullout, in other words, outside of the classroom in small group. 15 are push in, which means somebody comes to them in the classroom as part of a small group. Grades three through five have flexible groups with push in and math support. So we have somebody at present that is able to come into the classroom to provide them additional support in the classroom. Uh, and then we, we did uh, move forward with an eighth period math class. Uh, we have rostered um, 14 sixth graders, mon Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and 14 seventh, uh, seventh graders, Tuesday, Thursday. That's um, uh, after hours, uh, extended day. Attendance, you've seen these attendance figures in the earlier report, but um, important to note just how important attendance is to achievement. The two are very, very interrelated. Um, on the behavioral side, um, you know, we continue to focus on the, on the positive. 368 positive referrals uh, that our staff and teachers uh, in general have, have put forward. Very balanced, very balanced numbers. Of course, TK2, you catch those kiddos, they need immediate rewards, and we're, we're, we're definitely trying to cater that audience. But uh, as you see, quite a bit of catching them doing good, if you will, uh, in the grades, um, even up to middle school. Discipline referrals. Um, this, this is just a, a number that we're continuing to wrap, grapple with, 42 over the course of the year, with 14 resulting in suspension uh, or suspension events. Counseling data, we have a combination of group and individual counseling. Uh, eight of our students have um, what are considered individualized education plans. So they have uh, special needs that require um, or that may benefit, or in this case, it's, um, expect counseling services and we're able to provide that. And then an additional 28 general ed referrals coming through um, at, a, at any given time during the course of the year. And then in our after school programs, we expanded these programs. Uh, TK, our TK program uh, for this year will continue or has continued to extend the day to align it for those families that want dismissal or need dismissal, more aligned to the rest of the grade levels. So it's now aligned to K. Uh, we have 12 students currently participating in our K cohort, another 15 in first grade. And we purposely broke those two out, knowing that they're just in different age groups. Next slide, please. So I want to I want to start taking a look at this data, and this is probably the one that's going to capture the most attention, probably the one that's more going to capture the most questions. And it's the one that I want you to focus on and contextualize the most, because it is a single data point. And yes, it's an important one. Yes, it's one that helps us understand where students are, but it's one that um, that we've definitely spent a lot of time with staff and with teachers trying to risk grapple with ourselves. So you have there from left to right, the cohort uh, performance in last year's CAS, uh, 2022. So fourth grade, third grade doesn't have one because they haven't assessed yet. But from fourth through, through eighth, you'll see the results of last year's cohort. And as you see things go across, you see the performance from beginning of year through the winter. Now, over the course, now we are about mid-year, right? Mid-year. So we are trending, depending on the grade level, in a very positive way, or in certain other grade levels, we're a little flatter than we want to be. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we spent a lot of time really looking at this. And this just doesn't at a glance. This is just the percentage that on this particular measure are at or above literacy. What lies beneath that, we'll get to in a, in a, in a slide uh, just ahead, but I just wanna pause here because even within this, there's some conversations that stirred. Things as simple as uh, the fact that, that some tests, some of the grade levels have these as time tests. 
which is something that we have to uh, norm, norm across all of our grade levels. There's another question of what level of investment is there from students on these assessments, right? Are they seeing the results? Are they being communicated back? Uh, and if so, in what ways? Are students using them for goal setting or for their own personal understanding? And where are parents in all of this, right? Family members. So we've come to some decisions on this. Uh, we'll talk about those a little bit later, but just know that these very data points are ones that our staff is grappling with, trying to respond to, and trying to just take stock in no different than we are doing now. Uh, more so in fact, because they're working and, and living with students each and every day. Um, they also have a lot more information, right? What students are able to produce, do, uh, uh, undertake within their classroom. Next slide, please. That was literacy, this is mathematics, uh, same configuration and the same data sets. Now I wanna highlight something that's very, very meaningful. Um, one is that if you look at the grade performance and this one, I'm sorry, it doesn't have first grade, but that first, if you can go back to the literacy one, we now have 34 students uh, by winter that are fully able to access this particular uh, assessment. I don't have that data in front of me, but I will get it before we conclude. But a year ago, that number was far, far less. So what does it mean? It means that more of our students are able to read and comprehend in a way that cohort to cohort bodes well for us as we go through the rest of this year and as we think about them continuing to move ahead. Why? Because of all the efforts that we've put into being very specific, very targeted in the way in which we're teaching reading the way in which we're supporting students in their learning, accelerating and also remediating all at the same time through the combination of adults coming in and adults pulling students out. Uh, the coordination of schedules, the coordination of times has been phenomenal. Uh, and that's what it requires for us to continue to work in that regard uh, from the ground up. Same thing in math, uh, very promising early results that uh, compared cohort to cohort, are already showing results from last year's first grade to this year's first grade. Moving on. I wanted to share this with you because this is not comprehensive. This is one particular classroom, okay? One particular classroom. Uh, the distribution of these bars represents one student in that classroom, okay? So if you look at it from left to right as you're facing your screen, all of the students that performed in the green are students that are above that proficiency benchmark, scaled score of approximately 975 and above, okay? You see how many students performed under, how many were close, how many were far below the mark. Now, this was back in the fall, okay? Same classroom a few months later. Even though the number of students that has Cross that threshold of proficiency isn't where we would like it to be. I want to invite everybody to see the amount of growth that has happened. Okay. Not to, not to be glib about it, but it's like watching a seed grow. It's growing. You just happen not to see until it breaks through the, the, the surface. So depending on how we look at data, um, it's a very important piece. And this came out of conversations that we had with our teachers. And one particular teacher, this is one particular teacher's data. I, I don't, I'm not gonna disclose who that teacher is, but it's just came up in our conversation because when we started to dil, drill down, we talked about that particular report or that way of looking at data doesn't tell the whole story. But this tells a little bit more of the story of just how much growth there has been and we will continue to see as we enter the back half of the year. So growth like this uh, has been happening across our classrooms. And I just wanted to share one particular classroom story because um, it's just important to know that even though those numbers are not where we want them to be, the growth has been occurring through changes in instruction and changes in how we do, um, how we do our business on a daily basis. Sorry, you had a question. So what did you do to increase the reading level? We'd be here for a considerable amount of time for me to go into that. In a nutshell, teachers were far more targeted 
specific about where students needed to be. And they changed around their schedules. They changed around their routines to meet them where they were. That's the easiest, simplistic way that I can afford to, to tell you uh, the hard work that went into this. And we're still learning, but I'm, I really applaud our teachers for um, stepping up and, and just knowing that we needed to meet our kids where they are and not necessarily where we would like them to be. Sorry, Dr. Camby. Yeah, I'll, I'll stay here. Mm -hmm. Is it a mean or a median for the score value for each class? And is that a constant among all the classes? Or is it making the data is one class in the town where you're looking at it? Yeah, I, I can tell you that this is not an outlier classroom. I think it, it falls well in range. I'm not saying it's every classroom, but but we are seeing some accelerated growth in the in the the, the reporting of this particular assessment. And it's very encouraging to me because uh, you know it's hard work to reorient and retool what you do as a, as a practitioner, right? All of us as professionals know that. Um, and so that's, that's important for me to highlight one particular classroom that I think is representative um, and is not, I wouldn't say the outlier. I think it's well within average of what I'm seeing and what we are seeing across classrooms. Yeah, my The answer is yes, it's pre-built reports that we're able to see. And uh, we use our Wednesdays or our times like last Friday to be able to view this data, to make uh, mm -hmm. commitments and agreements on that data. And of course, bring other pieces of information to bear that don't necessarily, that aren't captured here, right? So uh, it's very dynamic. And, uh, but when it comes to this particular reporting, these are pre-built reports that um, have been uh, collated for parent for teachers to be able to receive, and that that is quite a bit of what we do in our regular cycles. What do the different colors mean? Because they don't seem to match up. Well, green is above that, but what changes? You know, a yellow to a blue. And what changes a red to a yellow? Uh, I I don't know that off the top of my head. I know that there are cut points that it, uh, that um, doesn't appear to be, to be so. Uh, well, between 13 and 14. Well, I, I'd have to get into the metrics of it, and I can't tell you that offhand. I'm just sharing with you one expression of how to look at that in a data set. That for us, um, when we talk about, when Dr. Kemi mentioned mean scores, um, and, and we are seeing increases in that, and increases above and beyond what you would expect to see over the pace of a school year, right? Uh, we want to see acceleration. Uh, because that's the only way that we're going to get kids closer to meeting the mark. Um, but I just I find this encouraging. And then, of course, you know, the, 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 the big conversation is, to what extent are students invested in this? That's a big question, especially as they get older. Uh, as they get older and they very compliantly go through an assessment, uh, are they bought in? Do they find value in it? And it's not that they don't find it meaningful, but are they putting forth their best effort? Are they going through the motions. Those are all just questions for us to continue to focus on so that we deal with the testing conditions being the best so that the kids can get feedback. And ultimately the families can get feedback. We have plans of being able to share this with families individually um, in, in a similar way that which we did the attendance data. All right, anything further? Uh, the attendance, I just wanted to bring it here because it's just so critical. And it is part of what we what you've already seen, but it's part and parcel of achievement. And um, I just wanted to, I won't spend time on it. We talked about that earlier, but a lot of intentional efforts are going toward attendance as well. So I wanted to just leave this for discussion and feedback. And one last point, um, just about acknowledgement of where, even though we are not in the, in the throes of a pandemic anymore, the impact to learning, the impact to students, uh, for those of us who work with them on a daily basis, we know it's real. And, and um, depending on the student, it's a greater or lesser extent, but um, we know we can't rewind time. We know that, but how can we accelerate learning? 
How can we meet them where they are? How can we remain engaged and continue to do uh, consistent collaborative work so that they can continue to grow exponentially, uh, which is what we need. So any uh, questions or feedback, this would be an opportune time for that. Any questions, comments? Um, I have one comment about this. I appreciate what how this is presented. There's still some questions as to uh, the data sets. I appreciate the, the singled out and I'm with uh, Jamie on what she said about are the teachers able to see this? But I see an inconsistency in the scale and not where the different levels are of the break off. There seems to be some inconsistency there. But I want to come back to the fact that there was a, a program that we had implemented here at Mesa Union a number of years ago that had a dramatic, a dramatic impact on literacy. And that was the Accelerated Reader Program. And I don't know why we phased away from that. But uh, basically what it does is it allows students to choose books, read them, take a small quiz on it, and get points. Are they still doing it? If they're still doing it, that's great. Because that's what... I'm sorry, go um, It turned my children into readers, avid readers that enjoyed reading. And take it to your book club that, that you were talking about, the, um, the, the Battle of the Books, which is a tremendous thing. And, and so... The more students that we can engage in reading, I don't know what kind of rewards are being given for those that are in the Accelerated Reader Program, um, but I fully support that. And lastly is that I, I would not want to, I know that we're doing a lot of recovery from the pandemic, and I know that we have great students, I know that we have great parents, and I know we have great teachers, but I would like to see us move to set our goals, not relate with relation to what how the state is doing so that we can feel good, but to set our goals in relation to how our students are doing so that they can see that they're seeing the progress and that they're meeting standards and that they're having success in what they're doing individually and saying that obviously it should be our desire that every student is reading at grade level and every student is doing uh, math at math level and have that confidence that they can do that and exude that confidence and that that's what our expectation is. I would firm believe that students, everyone lives up to expectations. So, and if we don't express what our expectations are, they'll never live up to them because they don't know what the expectation is. If there is none, then there's nothing to live up to. And so those are concepts that we as administration, we as a board, I think we should say, you know, the state says our, our goal should be X percentage and that we should be pleased that maybe 50% or 40% of our students are reading at grade level. And I say that we should, you know, maybe better understand what it means to be reading at grade level and up that standard. Or it, when I say up the standard, making sure that more of our students are exceeding that standard. Right. You know, and I, I agree with you. There's this there's such a strong connection between uh, being able to fluently read and be uh, at or above your grade level in terms of reading and the success in college. So I really think that we need to emphasize that. And we kind of are doing it with the Roaring Reader Awards. But before, I think like three years ago, we used to have the um, awards for AR points. And the, the kids would get medals for that. And I don't think that we do that anymore. So perhaps consider bringing that back so that kids, like you said, are taking these AR reading quizzes and getting a score and adding up their scores to reach a, a certain goal. Uh, so perhaps, you know, if it's not too much work, consider, consider bringing that in the assembly, assembly quarterly award ceremony. I'll tell you something that when this was first introduced that the Accelerated Reader Program, they gave out these little trophies and it really did nothing for the kids. The things that had the greatest impact in moving children was a pizza party with the principal and the mm -hmm. superintendent. Mm -hmm. That was the most important thing. And so it was that recognition that I achieved the goal and I'm going to get pizza and I'm going to be with the adults that recognize that. Them.
to be rewarded, not just the right. level, not and, just the level. And, and I agree with that, you know, that, and, and that is harder. I would agree with you that improvement, regardless of where you're at, is harder than meeting the level or exceeding it. So perhaps, you know, that, that is an option, you know, having classes compete against each other for a pizza party or some type of celebration that motivates them. All right, got that down. <laughs> oh, we'll talk about that next. <laughs> Anything further? All right. All right, moving on, is there a motion for the approval of the invoice from Low Voltage Solutions? Uh, be before, before you move forward, there's actually another item. Okay. District governance. Okay. This is the board's item. Um, back in January, where we last met, um, there were some things that, it, first and foremost, it was a really phenomenal um, workshop uh, where I'll just speak for myself. I got an opportunity to hear more about each and every one of you uh, independently, individually, about your background, about your wishes, your desires, your reason for public service. And I came away you know, very, very informed, much more. And, and I've been working with uh, several of you now for many, for many years. Um, I thought it was a great opportunity to onboard our trustee, um, Ms. Hupp. Um, and I'm hoping that we made her feel welcome and, and, and certainly a part of our governance team. Um, with that said, there were some takeaways also. There were some, some ways to maybe become a little bit more uh, organized, a little more succinct and revisit our uh, commitments to uh, one another and to ourselves. And so uh, there's two items here. Uh, they don't require board action at the moment. Um, I'm putting them here for informational uh, purposes. Um, the first is a governance calendar. Um, it's something that I know we followed um, and it's something that I wanted to make sure that, that all of you were aware of. Um, it lays out district business and the very, the, the very many facets of district life um, with some very specific projects. Each one of these is a project. Um, Ms. Mrs. Uh, Peterson here is, is our, our trusted partner in so many of these. When it comes to reporting, when it comes to um, our, our health and our financial standing, and you see that woven throughout this document. Uh, it's also an at a glance and a roadmap for us to be able to follow over the course of a, of a year. Now I'm bringing it to you mid here in an official capacity, but this is also going to become the blueprint for us next year. So um, it's an at a glance. Um, each and every one of these requires preparation, requires work, requires effort, follow-up. And of course, Mrs. Torres here, who has now fully experienced one full cycle. Doesn't feel like it, it feels like it's been several because she's just been okay. so great for us, but she, uh, you know, has had a hand in carrying these things out. Um, so I just wanted to share this with the board because uh, it's important that we recognize uh, how the board does its business and how we as, as staff uh, support your endeavors and work with one another. So uh, feel free to review, um, ask questions, discuss. Um, and it was important also to bring visibility to, to how dynamic this work is of running a public school district um, and what your major role is in doing so. Uh, the second document is um, agreements. Uh, changed the, the vernacular there a little bit. Uh, protocol sounded a little bit unmesa like to me. So I'd rather approach it from the state of agreements. And it indicates there what the board will do and what individual trustees are committing to doing what we together will do as the governance team, and then my responsibility as well to you and to the community. So I, I bring these forward to you for discussion, to be able to have a healthy dialogue, you know, and, and being able to be uh, keenly aware of one another's role and your role uh, relative to one another as members of this, um, of this board. So I, Turn it over to the board to comment on one document, both, uh, whatever you wish. We, go ahead. 
this document that you're showing us, is it any different from the protocol that we've seen in the past? This one is not. Um, slight, slight modifications, very, very minor. For example? The agreement at the top. The agreement at the top. Yes, just, just minor wordsmithing. I felt uh, from the moment I came on board, this is what I effectively inherited. And um, for me, at least, it was something that I could live with, more than live with, that I felt was a fair uh, compact, if you will, uh, to be able to strike. Um, and I've tried to play my part in it uh, since I've been um, a part of this, uh, this district. Well, let me ask you, is there anything that you believe the board should do to perhaps have a better or stronger relationship? I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to hold my comments because I, I really think it could be a good opportunity first to hear from the board and from the board to hear from each other, uh, because this is not just about me. This is about us. And it's about what you would like from one another. It's about what we want to have together, because the equilibrium that exists from the five of you as an entity and me as the executive in this particular district is critical. And uh, our relationship is one that needs to continue to be fostered uh, very keenly, but also amongst yourselves as a new team, right? With the addition of Ms. Hub, um, this became a new board. And I think it's important to be able to revisit those agreements uh, first by hearing from each other, I, I, I would offer, and then I can certainly give you my perspective. Any comments? Significantly, I'm not sure. There, there have been, and I mean, the cycle of LCAP, for example, is something that it is reflected there is seasonal, but it really is year round work. So I try to reflect that. There's some new elements that have come into, uh, for example, HR. I'll give you an example. It used to be, and I've shared this with the board, um, the March 15th timelines only apply to a certificated staff member, whereas now they apply to both certificated and classified. So those, those, Important differences are ones that for me and for us carrying out as staff, living out that, that calendar are very, very important. Um, uh, you know, this, this mid-year LCAP, for example, became statutorily um, mandated a year ago, but here I am, I'll speak for myself, trying to keep it because I believe that it's a good practice for us to have a conversation around where we are at the mid-year mark. So there are, I would say 75%, 80% of it is structurally the same because it's anchored around some very specific pieces of, of just compliance that are very important. Uh, but there are other pieces that are equally uh, relevant that have come in new. Um, and especially now, whether it's P1, P2, first interim, second interim, final adopted budget, while those have always existed, we're doing so in partnership with PSA but under a very different context, um, a financially uncertain landscape in the next 12 to 18 months and in an era now of declining enrollment. So I wouldn't say that the actions have substantially changed, but the context certainly has.
I think it helps us prioritize our I was going to say that, you know, when, when I first joined the board, I don't think we had this calendar, this governance calendar. It was about five or six years ago, maybe I think we put it together. And really, I think three or four of us looked at each other and kind of said, what are this, what's the heartbeat or what's the pulse of what we're doing here? And it really kind of laid it out and gives you kind of the deadlines and the, the time frame, just to kind of see how it repeats itself with the other kind of things that we have to add in there. So it was very helpful to kind of get a grasp of what some of the day-to-day, -day, not day-to-day, -day, but some of the big bigger, I want to say finite kind of things that we had to do every every year. So it really helped put a roadmap out there. What? There are certain things that we have to do on it. Yeah, That's just on a deadline. routine basis. So I think that was very helpful. And, and I think that it gives us all a good uh, uh, guidepost there. The other regarding the, um, uh, not the policies, but the uh, agreement there, this is kind of something that also came during uh, some of the, the board kind of restructuring and governance stuff. I think that started kind of before I joined the board about six six or seven years ago. And and I think it was uh, it's always been there, but I don't think we actually codified it a little bit and brought it forward. So that's another thing here to kind of put it forward that we have. We do have something kind of formally that we, we agreed to adhere to as far as an agreement as a board, superintendent as a governance body. So I think it's just helpful to put it forward there and make it also public knowledge too, because I don't know if it was out to the public before. So just make sure that we have it out there for everybody to see. If I can make a comment on what you just said about, uh, we put together the what was then known as the protocols um, and we did codify it and it has been codified, but maybe not reviewed. And it should be reviewed on an annual basis, I think. There's probably a better way to look at that. And uh, we changed the name uh, agreements. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. I'm sorry I missed that. Um, but um, that's something I think we should review on a, on a, at least an annual basis so that we're on the same team. I agree with that. I'm going to come back to the governance calendar. And you mentioned human resources. And, and there's one thing that kind of sticks out to me the most and that is the finalized superintendent goals and success indicators um the superintendent goals and and this has to do with us working together as a board i, I would like to see those finished by the end of june because to me these aren't being done until october which means that then your goals are not being sent out to the teachers and to the staff until halfway through the first semester. And now they've got to figure out how they're going to implement these things. The purpose of our having goals all together is so that you can develop goals so that you can communicate with staff so that they have something. So when the school starts that um, they've got something to run with and we're not changing, you know, boats halfway through the stream. And, you know, that that's just a timing thing. I would much prefer to see that. Um, towards the end of the school year so that that's communicated to the staff and so that everybody's on the same page so that we're all working on the same things for the entire school year. This is one of those things that in a government bureaucracy that just seems to slow things down that in order to implement uh, like CHAMPS for example took three years to accomplish because we have to evaluate it you know first we have to look at what's available for a year and then we have to evaluate the one that we chose for a year then we take the third year to implement and and that's forever for our students um and so i'd much rather say let's get on board and let's get our our uh, staff on board the first day of school so they're all working towards the same goals um, and so I, I would like to move that uh, i'm going to suggest you're, you're the man in charge. We hired you to do the job, but my suggestion is that we that look to move that to a different location so that everybody's starting. Uh, Jan, hopefully, I was able to explain my rationale. Yes, and and let me let me make one one mention. So I want to point the board in the line, the row that says effective governance. So that got beefed up, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that. Um, you know, when we talk about, if so, take a look. Bear in mind, this is for the 22-2023 school year, right? It's in progress. I'll point to something that um, Dr. Canby mentioned back in um, January, January 14th, which is 
you know, we are a tanker, right? And it's going to take a while to kind of reorient. So we have to lay things out in a way that doesn't seem jarring uh, as a governance team. So my goal, if you look at the bottom or that line, is to come up with a new calendar if you will, that lays out the year ahead before this year is out. So right now we're in progress, but to your point, we're going to lay that out differently. So in that, you see governance calendar for this year in February. We want to lay that out again, probably in May or June. And if you go to the, to the far end. So what you have there in May and June is a board self-evaluation. I want to propose to the board that you consider uh, self-evaluating, whether that's by a tool or some metric to be able to signal how you determine success and your own success for that matter. Uh, the other one is board priorities for the following school year. Yeah. And I think that's where the timeliness of this document comes in. So I want to I want to just say one, one last thing. Um, the idea is to codify this year to year. Um, and if nothing changes because everybody seems satisfied and the board feels confident that, that it, it is truly what everybody individually and collectively can live to, including myself as a governance uh, team, then we leave it. But we know that it's a recommitment. And if some things are seasonal or some things maybe require attention, that we have the courage to be able to say that, right? And be able to put that forward and say, you know, this is something that we need to figure. So with that in mind, let me offer up one last thing. I offer this governance calendar because that gives you, this is my executive calendar. It's what I need to prepare for you as a board. It's what our team here needs to prepare. And as you consider requests or ideas or further areas and lines, bear in mind, this is statutorily what I need to do. So the question becomes, what's the, what's the limit to that? And that is something that the entire board needs to consider. When you're tasking me to do something, it's not just tasking me, it's tasking my team. And there does come a point where there's just too much. There's only so much that we can reasonably do. And it's something to, for you to just be aware of as we need to, to, to approach every season and every set of projects. And I mentioned that with, with just a tremendous amount of respect for, for the fact that I think all of you understand that, but it's not until we get into the daily details that we find that I'll just speak for myself. I do and I deal with everything from frontline issues all the way up to the bond and then some. So the gamut for me is pretty wide. And if there's anything, uh, I'll just tell you my day today. Uh, it went from uh, uh, a plumbing, a plumbing issue, all the way out to uh, an IEP that took three hours, to a showcase, to this board meeting. That's just today. And I invite you to consider that because my responsibilities are far and wide. And if I go this way, I need to know that you are all supporting me in going that way and understanding that if there's gonna be a pivot, it's with all of you knowing something's gotta go, something's gotta give. I've gotta ignore something to do something new. And so when we talk about our agreements or our commitments, just understand that I can't differentiate between a good idea and, uh, and uh, something that you expect action on. I need clarity on that. I need the board to be very clear that you are, you are asking the superintendent to take action on something. Because otherwise, I just can't tell the difference. I cannot tell the difference between something that is a good idea to consider or something that the board is expecting me to take action on. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, it, it makes um, sense. But this is also, it's these forums is the only time that we as a board get to get together. Correct. And Correct. say this is what we want. Correct. Um, Correct. Like yes. I just put forth something that I think that is worthy. But yes. I can't, I, I'm one of five. Correct. And this is the only forum that we have to discuss these things. Correct. And so I put this out there saying that, you know, that's my idea. He, he can't take action. I, I got that. 
but if how do we formalize that here as a board because my experience says that over the years is like we finally got our goals and now that gets disseminated down to the teachers which means that you know they're halfway through a semester or at the end of a semester before they even have their goals set for the year and i think that that should be perhaps rethought or yeah. reorganized and and, and it's, I, an, it's an important piece. Yeah. and and i would agree with you and i think um here's what i would ask because we can we can delve into this conversation quite a bit I'm bringing it up for information right now to have this discussion, to generate this thought. Um, if you have input and there will be more input to be had, um, please propose it. Send me send me a follow-up email where I can just collect it and then be able to, or call me. Uh, because then what I can do is get in individual information and assimilate it into something that I can bring back to the board just for this year. We're not going to focus right. on next year yet. Uh, but we will by the time that the end of the year comes through and I'll propose something different um, or, or something adjusted um, for, the, for the remaining part of uh, next year. I want to be able to just solidly put this in place for the remaining part of this year because we're already in motion and then be able to live it out differently where we put in placeholders throughout the rest of the year where we can discuss these things more formally. The other thing I want to say is I want to get back to... Uh, uh, scheduling two-on-ones or one-on-ones. I kind of move forward with some of you on that. It's been incredibly helpful to me. And then the other, the last thing I'll say is uh, when it comes to this is uh, those special board workshops, you know, prioritizing key times during the year where you can have a more, um, just a better environment, right? To have those critical conversations, to understand where we are and to act as bellwethers for how do we how to move forward? So I just wanted to put this out there so that we can formalize our agreements and then um, certainly get feedback and put some topics on the table. You know, at the last uh, workshop, we talked about prior to the uh, every board meeting having a discussion about where we're at. I mean, is that something that we're going to start perhaps next next month or? What is the will of the board? The idea was to maybe come in earlier on some choice times over the course of the year. They don't necessarily have to be every month, but to be able to have a, a conversation, a study session, or something to that effect with a very specific topic, something very specific, probably one, maybe two topics, but that's it because that conversation just needs to breathe a little. So if you'd like to, we could make this a conversation where we workshop format and make the calendar something where we think about next year or the agreements uh, or perhaps a, uh, what are your thoughts around a board evaluation, self-evaluation? Is that something that the board has appetite for? I mean, how would that work, a self-evaluation? Can you elaborate a little bit more, explain? Well, well, that's that's open. See, I, I provide you with a self-evaluation, right? I, I, I write up based on my goals what I feel like I've accomplished and highlights for you to consider. And I do that twice, effectively twice a year, mid-year and end of year. The board would have to determine for itself, how do you um, gauge your success? Independent of me, right? How do you gauge your success? And I bring that here just to reflect, just to turn the lens inward, to say, okay, so I'm an individual, but I'm also a part of a team. How do I do that? Well, and I'm not saying we do it. I'm not even, I'm just putting it out there to the board for something to consider. I think it's something to consider, but I also would just say, please, I don't know how to wrap my hands around it. Because again, we can't meet together and talk together on a lot of topics. It would have to be agendized, yes. And so it would, it would have to be, and so, and so I'm not sure how to wrap my mind around that, but what I think personally would be a better use of our time if we said we continue with um, this agreement or the calendar or to spend more of that focus time on our priorities, like, because that is the idea of the June, you know, what we have on the executive calendar for the June meeting is having our priorities set for the next school year. And so I think once once that is made, it may be helpful, like 
in a year to come where we could also have an evaluation. But I think the difference is currently you have goals that are established and then we look at those goals and then you evaluate, you provide comments, um, you try to you know, give you comments and and then we kind of see how these are with, right? And so I think the whole thing is you have to start with the goal and the priorities. Then we'd be able to track that otherwise we're evaluating ourselves with no baseline, right? So I think if we prioritize and really see what small number of goals you want to focus with next year, a lot of us, just like you know for your own head, um, but that might be a better use of our time and effort. Well, so I wanted to offer up that we do have priorities for this year that we talked about in January. I'd like to, in March, bring those forward because that'll, I think, help propel us for not just the remaining part of this year, but many of these board priorities are multi-year, you know, uh, and, and, and they continue to be priorities that we just maybe break apart in smaller chunks or smaller increments, right? So what I'm getting at is uh, maybe that could be an opportunity. So here's what I'm hearing, and I want to be able to be mindful of time because, you know, we've, we've got a lot. Number one is uh, there's good affirmation that this is a practice that we should engage in. So there's there's positivity there. Uh, the second thing is bringing uh, maybe forward priorities as this first cycle and really anchoring on priorities, uh, not just for the remaining part of this year, but as they shape up for next year. So uh, that's a big piece. The evaluation, maybe we'll put that off to the side for a, for a spell and then figure out a way to maybe, maybe I can show you some samples of other boards and what they considered for the future, okay? Um, and then um, just making some good revisions to this calendar so that it can really be personalized to what all of you know is important. Because an, a, a missing piece of this is, what celebrations do we wanna see? When do we wanna see them? So that the board can be well in tune with what's coming ahead, right? Well, and, and what I said prior to this about you know, I was focused on what your goals were and, and just what I've looked at things historically. That comes back to us because I, by April or May, we need to be giving to you what our expectations are for the coming year, even though the current year may not be complete so that you can formulate those because we give you very broad goals with an expectation that you will then say, how do I accomplish this? And you usually send for feedback from staff saying how can we accomplish these things and work collaboratively um ultimately I'd like, my my personal feeling is i'd like to see that all resolved by the beginning of the school year so that when you have your orientation days uh the teacher prep days prior to school starting you can say we've discussed this here's where we're at this is where we're going these are the goals that we should be trying to accomplish um, rather than saying, okay, at the, by the end of October, here's where I'm at. Now let's filter it out and so on and so forth. And so it all begins with us getting to you what the board expectations are. And so that there should probably be a time set aside in April or May that we can have a separate agendized item to where we can do an evaluation and set the priorities for the school for the coming year to allow you that time to do the work that you need to do. And so it, it's it's a collaborative thing uh, and it begins here with this board. And so I, I'm trying to backstep and saying, here I saw the, the end goal. And so I'd like to move that up some so that beginning of school year, everybody's starting in step to begin with and then trying to figure out when they've already started teaching that that's a, a burden that we put on teachers that we shouldn't have to. So here's what I'd like to do. Um, and, and I want to get the feel of the, of the board on, on support for this, is continue to modify this just a bit, the governance calendar, bring it back for some action, as well as the agreements for action. That way it's something that the board can vote on. And be okay? But beyond that, also bring up for discussion the board priorities for the year. Um, that way we see them in March, knowing that the rest of the year is still upon us, and that we can modify those as we see over the months of March, April, and May, so that by June, those are pretty well established. And in a perfect world, they'd be well aligned 
to the goals of the LCAP. That way, these right. plants aren't all spinning in their own universe. Right. Yeah, simply moving the, the board, uh, board priorities from the following school year from June to March, April, and then moving, I would say, moving the approval of board government calendar to maybe June going forward or even beginning of this, something instead of mid year, that would be there. So beginning yeah. of the year, yeah. move the priority up so we have that. So. And, and you bring up a very good point that we need to be cognizant of what the LCAP is so that we're in unison. And that that's a part of that equation. All right. Okay. Anything further? That's that's it. It. Is that good enough direction? <laughs> yes. And, and are we unified on that as a board? Uh, that 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 would be uh, a comment right. because when it comes to the board, I've learned silence does not equal consent. I know that's why I'm asking the board president maybe to to get a feel for that. And is that direction you want to give the president, uh, the superintendent? All right, moving on. You guys want time to think on that. I would say, I'm but I also I realize that we're talking about the same Right. Mm -hmm. So, whether it's this school cycle or the next one, I think as long as we're shifting, right? That's the target. It's not to be dead on on a certain like June last day of school. We're all ready for the next year. That to me is very overwhelming and very demanding of Dr. Meredith's this kind of effort. But I think if we're moving and shifting, and then we get to where we want to be with that little bit of flexibility, to me, I think. All right, so we're just going to push it back and try and get it resolved before before the end of the school year. All right, so moving on, uh, is there a motion for the approval of the invoice from Low Voltage Solutions? Make a motion for the security approval of the invoice from Low Voltage Solutions. Is there a second? I will second. Any discussion? This was the monitoring and fire suppression. Uh, okay. And we're also seeking some sort of, uh, on the backside, we discussed this last month, um, but you're also seeking, like, why was it, you know, destroyed to begin with? That That's still yeah. in progress. Uh, and that, that, we're looking to tie that out. Yes. Keep that on, on yes. the, your, your mind. Um, but I'm all in favor of this. Yeah. All right. All in favor? Aye. Right. Motion carries 5-0, no opposition. All right, is there a motion for the consideration of approval of the invoice for Ventera Environmental? Make a motion for the approval of the invoice for Ventera Environmental Incorporated. Is there a second? Okay. Any discussion? I just had a question. This was about the abatement and the cleanup. Was all the lab analytical included in this as well? Yes. Yes, we received a comprehensive report, including um, uh, two different air samples or testing uh, testing cycles. Anything further? All right. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries 5-0. No opposition. Is there a motion for the consideration of the proposed change orders from Monet Construction? Uh, proposed orders, proposed change orders listed one through five. I move that we approve the change orders uh, from Monet Construction numbers one through five. Is there a second? I'm sorry. Yeah, I second. No, I'm okay. sorry. Any discussion? I guess I just wanted to point out it's a mix of credit. Yeah. It looks like things were just how it phased, you know, the last phase. You know. Anything uh, further? Yeah. Anything further? All in favor? Aye. Motion carries 5 0, no opposition. Is there a motion for that consideration of approval of the ratification? of the Ventura County Office of Education Technology Service Level Agreement from December 5, 2022 through December 30th, 
2023. I move that we approve the ratification of the Ventura County Office of Education Technology Service Level Agreement from December 5, 2022 through December, uh, June 30th, 2023. Is there a second? A second. Any discussion? That is correct, yes. And we also folded in a monthly charge. Uh, it was basically folded into the service level agreement. Anything further? All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 5 0 and no opposition. Is there a motion for the consideration of approval of the ratification of the Memorandum of Understanding for data sharing between Ventura County local education agencies? I'll second. There's a second. Any discussion? I guess I want to just confirm that there are signatures from prior years. No, it's consistent with prior years. All righty. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries 5-0 and no opposition. All right, is there a motion for the consideration of approval of, I believe I got the right. A motion for the consideration of approval of the job description for a school counselor. Make a motion for the approval of the job description for school counselor. I'll second it. Any discussion? This is an emphasis for junior high. That is correct. So let me take one step back. Um, Mrs. Peterson and I have been in this ongoing com conversation around, you know, how to best handle. Um, the needs of the campus, particularly with social emotional learning being such an important undertaking. And I, I predict it'll be that way for the next coming years. Um, this is a step. I don't, I still, I will be very honest. I don't know if this is something that we will be able to manage or not. Uh, we have contracted through the county um, and we've discussed different scenarios. Um, I think it would be best for us to move in this direction somebody who has a pupil personnel services credential and that would be catering to the middle school but be available to the entire campus um, so i just wanted to come up with a robust and appropriate job description for now with um, some more conversation with our uh, muta partners and with uh, the county office to see what's feasible um, because the need is there we know that um, but it's a matter of making it fit within our budget. Right, uh, to me, this is just the job description. The next step would be then looking to hire and, and evaluating whether or not there's revenue and then declining Co enrollment correct. requirement. Correct, correct, salary schedule. That's, yes, yeah. correct, correct, correct. So either way, if, if it doesn't come to pass this time around, it'll lay idle or, you know, we'll figure this out, no, but in the, the next meantime, two months, most likely. We'll but in the meantime, VCOE is filling that need. Correct. Correct. Yes, through a through a service contract. The cost. No, I got that. At a and when you do your presentation, cost. giving us that cost will be very important in the evaluation as to whether or not to move forward. But anyway, that's now it's not that time. Yes. So think of this as an incremental set of steps, but a, an important one for the time being. Will the VCOE person be required to uh, follow this job description? Uh, the job functions are similar, but I'm afraid to say that's there, those two are just different functions. Uh, part of the reason that I'd like to pursue this is because this offers us much more flexibility and more value add, in my opinion, just because it would be somebody uh, with a more dynamic set of skills and more closely aligned to the academic program as well. So this proposed counselor that may you know perhaps be hired would be here. Physically here, correct, and could do you know, a variety of other uh, duties. Co correct. We'd have to figure out scope and scale, but uh, you know we have a middle school, and the fact that we don't have a guidance counselor uh, on staff is um, it's it's troubled me since I've been here. Uh, but um, 
but I've seen it much more starkly in the last year, um, particularly as we look at this articulation with the high schools. Um, I just think there's a lot of information and programming that we could offer our, our, our sixth through eighth students that would be a tremendous value add. Is this something we, I was gonna say, is this something that I know we're talking about bringing that in-house here. Is this something that might we might want to have, have a shared with some of the other smalls? We've discussed that scenario as well, and that's something that we're we're trying to figure out whether that's feasible, uh, because we just know that the need again the need is there and the costs continue to rise. And how do we get the most value for a position? So that's part of the consideration as well. When was the last time Mesa Union had a school counselor here physically? No. That that would be a great question. I don't know. I think there are some very specific guidance counselor functions, like course pathways, programming, um, and, and and so much has changed in guidance counseling. It is not the guidance counseling of my generation. It is completely different, more hands on, more programming, small groups. It's so much more dynamic. I think the job description is is accurate um, and current. Um, but Mesa, in my recollection, in my digging around with staff, has not had that um, as a regular um, member of the of the community. And some of you who've been around far well, longer. Than I, I think we're talking about apples and oranges. We've had counselors here, but not necessarily guidance counselors. Sure. And, and that's what this is. And so. Yeah, that's really yeah correct. Yeah. Correct. We had an existing external contract similar to the way that we do right. with the county office to support triage and counseling right. and I think that's something that is still in need of course but I'm talking about the academic component right. the ability to help so a family or children project course enrollment and pathways because I'm just finding that no matter who the family is I'm seeing that there's a lot of need for that um, because anyway I won't go on my point is that I think that it's a step in the right direction and right now it's, it's about the job description and buying us time to see if it's something we can bring in some capacity. All right, anything further? All in favor? Aye. All right, motion carries, 5-0 and no opposition. Is there a motion for the consideration of approval of the agreement between the Ventura County Office of Education and Mesa Union School District for K through eight library support services between August 1st, 2022 through June 30, 2023. Make the motion for the approval of the agreement between Ventura County Office of Education and Mesa Union School District for K through 8 library support services between August 1st, 2022 and June 30, 2023. I'll second. Any discussion? Are those dates correct? I mean, we're going back to August of 2022 and coming, bringing this forward and now? As somebody from VCO, we've been performing that service. Uh, no, that would that would get us covered for for this school year. Uh, but no, nobody has has moved ahead. So this is not a ratification. Um, so if you feel a need to uh, modify it, I'm I'm fine with that. Um, but um, no. So I just want to answer your question straightforward. That is not retroactive, or or for work un already undertaken. All right. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just my, my question is, it says it's a state mandate that every district have that. So we've not had that up until- We, we have not had that. And we, we do need to satisfy that compliance right. factor, yes. So would the agreement be, when would the start date of the agreement be? August 20th. It, it would effectively be now, as soon as the board approves it. So okay. that would be the start date, but for us, it would still allow us to be able to um, credit that service for the school year. So it is something that we need to report on. Understood. Okay. Anything further? All right. Uh, the one comment I will make is that uh, in my conversations with the librarian for VCOE, Ashley Nishia, um, phenomenal, dynamic. I think we've already established some priorities for what our library and library services. Uh, can look like. And um, I'm just very excited to move forward with her specifically in that role because of um, uh, conversations that I've had with colleagues about her effectiveness. So um, everything from policy to on 
on on premise support and professional learning also for uh, teaching staff around the dynamic world of information and how it's gathered. I, th I just think that we're going to be very well poised to move forward. So I appreciate the board support. Will it change anything with our uncertified librarian? It will not. It will actually be a value add, to be okay. honest with you. And uh, Casey Lutz has been phenomenal. Um, and she and I have spoken about this numerous times. And I think it will only help her um, develop and, and grow in her role. All righty. Anything further? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 5 0. No opposition. Is there a motion for the consideration of approval of the 2023 2024 Mesa Union School District academic calendar? I move that we approve the 2023-2024 Mesa Union School District of Academic Council. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? I just want to confirm that it's in line with the Austin High School District, and especially now more of like the winter break I know that it's intentional because it's informed by others i won't go as far as to say that it matches up the, the core of the break does match up very well because uh if for no other reason other than the the, the placement of the holidays um over the winter season um, and the inclusion of those additional dates has everything to do with our um, uh, recent agreement with our bargaining unit around specific days of professional learning and how to pace them and space them in a way that's most effective. But it yeah. is uh, it is aligned and 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 pretty on par with Oxnard Union. The additional days were uh, January eighth and. Which other ones? So the additional dates are the 15th, the 16th of August. Those are the first two. There's an additional date in um, no October, October 30th. And then fast forward to February, uh, I'm sorry, January 8th and February 16th. You said 15 and 16, is that uh, 16 and 17? Or 16? Uh, in August, it's actually the 15th and 16th. The 17th, 18th, and the 21st are teacher led and that's typically for preparation as we launch the school year. Oh, all right. Mine's a little different. And okay. this has been better through both Muta and Musk. It has through Muta in particular. Um, it has been, yes. And it's very consistent with the with the um, prior year's calendar. So okay. yes. There will be further conversation with both of our with our staff at large and our classified and certificated unions around this because there's um, some pieces that have not been determined, such as the start of our kindergarten TK um, regular day schedule. That's something that's still pending. Here's something I noticed uh, uh, other schools have done after the Halloween day when it falls midweek, sometimes at following day on the first is sometimes more of a teacher that Monday moving that to the Wednesday because some kids are not in good learning shape after a Halloween I just throw that out there as a possibility I don't know if that's too much trying to fine-tune things a little too much but I just throw that it, out there it's it's a hard it's a hard one I completely understand that culturally um let me let me put some thought into that with the staff uh, it's all about trade-offs it's only a half day the next day anyway. It's all about trade-offs. But if you look at it, it's only a half day. You know, uh, it's, and and I think, I, I'm actually very proud of this calendar, to be honest with you. I think it's more geared towards some of our discussions, conversations, priorities, um, including, uh, I'd like to point out that we backed up uh, the parent conference schedule to right prior to the break. Um, that's just something that um, I think instructionally works better for us. Um, that that met with pretty robust um, input. Say again. Correct. I think we're better positioned there to be at the tail end of trimester one. Um, 
more conversations for sure to, to happen with our staff. All right. Anything further? More than anything else, I really wanted to just signal to our community when our when our what our calendar would look like, uh, because it's important for them to be aware of it as they make their plans. Right. All right. Anything further? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries five zero. Is there a motion for the consideration of approval of the AVID agreement? I move to approve the AVID agreement. I'll second the motion. Any discussion? I have a question. You know, I, I think you mentioned before that this was previously part of Mesa some time ago. Yes. And then it went away and now it's coming back. Can, can you explain, you know, how it worked before and why it went away and why it's coming back? Yes, absolutely. So uh, AVID was a, a program that, a partnership that existed here pre-pandemic. Um, and it was a much more scaled down program. It, there's kind of three different program options, okay, in middle school. There is an elective where a very targeted group of students are supported via a class in their schedule. That's one option. The other one is school-wide, where every single school, every teacher um, in a particular grade span or across the whole school is trained on AVID as a program and then implement specific strategies. And then the third one is a combination of the two. Um, I'm less interested in AVID as an elective. I think it has a purpose, but for us, what is more impactful is for us to go school-wide, uh, grades five through eight. There are uh, facets of the program that I think our school, our students across the board would benefit. Every single one of our parents have asked, has aspirations for their kids to do something, um, you know, of, of great value by the time they go to high school and beyond. And AVID has uh, just a bevy of very specific and targeted skills, uh, competencies, and strategies to help students become uh, successful at the collegiate level. In the world of work, as communicators, I mean, you name it. I'm a firm, firm believer, and it's got a long proven track record. So um, that's what we've talked about as a staff, is making sure our grades five through eight are trained and effectively uh, implementing or starting the implementation this coming year. So why did it go away? Uh, to be honest with you, I would attribute it to the leadership change. Um, it happened during the... the um, during the pandemic and in the transition between Mr. Turner as superintendent and myself coming in. At that time, there were some other priorities to, to, to really tend to. And um, the elective offering um, just wasn't something that we were necessarily prioritizing at that time. Now that I've had a couple of years here, I wanted to re-engage with that partnership and our staff was uh, very supportive, very open to the idea. So I don't, I wouldn't pin the blame on anyone or anything so much as it was one of those things that just didn't get prioritized um, throughout the, the throes of the pandemic. Anything further? All right. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries 5-0. No opposition. And there's a, there's... Is there a motion for the consideration of approval of the ratification of the field trip request to UCSB? I, I move that we ratify uh, and approve this field trip to UCSB, the Reef and Marine Science Institute. A second. Any discussion? Who are we ratifying? Okay. What are we? We're approving the field trip. Didn't we already approve it? Are we changing it? It was a ratification. It's a ratification. So the field trip already occurred. Yeah, yeah. I went on it. Yeah. That's why I'm <laughs> right. So that you're you're asking whether it approved what you're you're asking I thought whether, we already approved this. No, no, it didn't it didn't get approved. We looked through our records and it the it was a clerical mix up on our end.
I'm, I was trying to see, like, is, did the times change? Because we came back a little bit earlier. No, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, we had it very well on our radar. It happened, went well. Uh, it was but, a great trip. But the, the, right the board now. did yeah. not ratify it. I'm sorry, the board did not approve it. And so that is um, my mistake, our fault, and we're trying to correct. Uh, I'm grateful. Uh, I've mentioned it on my way in. I was able to bump into Ms. Jar, who helped facilitate this. And I'm grateful for the things that she has brought to the school. And I shared that with her uh, to let her know that it, it's trips like this, the trip to see me, um, that just add another dimension to another cohort of our students and uh, allowing them to see things that they would not normally see. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more on all fronts. And I think it, our science program is something that uh, six through eight um, is a real treasure, a real strength of ours. I want to continue to foster it, see it grow. And uh, a nice way of saying also that, or reminding the board that we have a pilot um, of instructional materials well underway. And I think that will only take our program to another level. Anything further? All right, all in favor? Aye. Motion carries 5-0, no opposition. All right, uh, moving on, is there a motion for the consideration of adoption of the December 2022 board policy revisions? I know there's some with several options. Okay, I'd like to move to adopt um, as presented or amended. I'll second the motion. Any discussion? <laughs> How did you know that I would have come? <laughs> um, there are several with options. Um, some are laid out in the board packet and some are not. Um, the ones laid out with respect to board policy 430, um, option two is for a multi-district for special education. Option one is a single district. Well, we are a single district, special education, we partner with SOMAS. And so, and you know, some of the smalls on that. So to me, option two, um, I concurred with Dr. Ramirez's suggestion, it made sense. Um, similar on board policy 450, the comprehensive safety plan. Option one um, was if you had over 2,500 ADA, um, that way you could break it out to make it school specific if you wanted to. But if you have less than 2,500 ADA, then you could just do a district-wide plan, which is what Dr. Ramirez was suggesting. Um, and then his other suggestion was with uh, board policy 50, 5137 um, with regards to weapons and dangerous instruments that could be brought on site. Option one allowed kids to bring pepper spray on campus and option two prohibited bringing pepper spray he recommended option two. I agree. I think that's a great idea. 5137? Let's see. 5137 or 5131.7. Okay, 5131.7. Option two was not to bring pepper spray. Okay. So I was a fan of not bringing any weapon on so site. Prohibit that. It would prohibit that. Um, my, there are some other ones that have options, but they weren't really called out. So I wasn't sure if you wanted to go through those or not. Some of them have multiple options in the same board policy. So, and that's specifically with regards to the before and after school programs. Um, that one also has some options regarding um, if you will not charge at all for after school programs or, if, or option one is that it would be no charge. Option two would be that you may charge. It's not that you have to, but that you may, but it would only be based on the actual cost of the program. So you couldn't just charge whatever you wanted. It had it would have to be based, you know, with the uh, um and then there was also more options in that with regarding um to potential LCAP money using that as well. So I didn't know how we wanted to unpack because there's more than one options in some of those with regards to before and after school. And also with regard to the governing board elections, there's a lot of option steps. Why, why don't you, why don't you, um, I mean, I would propose that the board maybe single those out and we can bring them back next month with maybe so some more ones, time. So which one specifically are you highlighting? 
think the, she's highlighting 51.8.2, 51 correct? Yeah. And yeah. also the other one that has several options is 92.20, which is about, uh, well, actually options. that one it only has two options. We can either take action there or- Well, really there, I feel like we, we can take option um, on that one. There are the filling of vacancy. Well, there's a couple. Um, because one we've already chose to do because it's whether it, you're doing the trustee area at large or a hybrid. So we've, we've already so chosen would be to do, one. But, but then there's also options, options for determination of that or um, SOQs for the number of words um, allowed in certain openings and what you're allowed to say. And then if the district would be willing to um, pay for any of those elections, and so there's there's a couple of different things with regard to that. So I didn't know if you wanted to to discuss the board bylaw policies as well. Um, you know, those there's just ones at the end, those board bylaws and policies, um, and the after school program at a separate time, or if we wanted to go through those this evening. I, I did read that and there's a lot of subsections and I I don't think that we need to take action. We can just adopt and at, at some point you know, take action if necessary. And I think most of it is, you know, if, if there's two board members running and there's a tie, then what do we do? Does the board decide who wins or or do you let them have a, a runoff? Um, do I? I yeah, knowing that a runoff is a cost of the district. Yeah, so that's why I think we need more. Yeah, uh, so if, 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 it's, if it's satisfactory to the board, uh, maybe we can um, bring back, um, BP 5148, BPAR 5148.2, as well as the board bylaws. Uh, once the board's had an opportunity to review those individually and then- um, And compare against current practices. And compare against current practices is right. Because there, I imagine knowing the board as I do, I wanna minimize the exposure of costs to the district. Um, so maybe there can be some recommendations within that uh, I can suggest and offer up, okay? So we're now looking at approving all of these with the proposed options and with the exception of BP 4148.2, AR 5148.2, and uh, four board bylaws, 9220, 9223, 9323, and uh, board policy 3260. That would be correct. And, it, and carve out 5148.3. Yeah, 9220. Uh, the three bylaws and board policy. Yeah. 9323 and 3260. All right. Is there a motion for the consideration of adoption? On the December 2022 board box. Do we need that amended? Policy revisions at AR 0430, option two, BP 40, I'm sorry, BP 50, option two, AR 5131.7, option two, uh, and exclude for. Uh, Future discussion. AR 5148.2, BP 5148.3, Board Bylaw 9220, 9223, 9223, and 3260. And adopt the rest. As outlined with the options for. BPAR 430, uh, 450, 460. Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. So, is this a, a proposed amendment? So, we're going to amend to exclude those. We are amending to exclude the uh, board bylaws and the AR and 5148.2 and uh, BP 5148.3. As amended, but do we need do we need to 
approve and make the amendment? That's my question. I don't think so. I mean, that we can just state that we're excluding that? those. Yeah. yeah. And that's so, our amendment. That is our amendment. Yep. Okay. So is there a second? I'll, he's got it. Okay. Dr. Candy said. Okay. Any discussion? Aye. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Aye. Motion carries 5 0. No opposition. Uh, is there a motion for the I move that we uh, accept the resignation of, of Leslie Schwartz, effective February 24, 2022. Is there a second? Is that correct, 2022? Uh, yeah, that's right, I thought 2023. All right, any discussion? All in favor? A motion carries 5-0, no opposition. And items for future consideration, we have the LCAP and our next meeting is March 14 at 6 p.m. Um, and I guess that's it for now. We adjourn at 9.10, 9.08.